Well, good, Renee, you're here, all the way from Germany. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm Dr. Russ, we're in my backyard, and we're gonna have some fun today. We're in South uh, East Michigan, and we happen to be in a part that has an awful lot of these destructive uh, critters running around. Uh, I mean, really destructive. I'll share that with you in a minute. Uh, so I thought what we would do, since it's 17 degrees, still snowing, we have about eight to nine inches down now, another inch coming tonight. It's 17 degrees now, but at night it's five, and the wind chill drops at another 10 degrees. So we had a video planned, uh, the Hatson Bull Boss air rifle, and we were gonna compare it with some other Hatsons, but unfortunately, <laughs> this cold weather has prevented all that. So we've pushed it off and we moved some other videos up front to launch, and they're on trapping all kinds of critters with repellents, poisons, everything from mouse traps up to, I don't have a bear trap, but we got things that get close to being a bear trap. Uh, I should tell you about the future. We're doing a video on comparing a crossbow with uh, that shoots over 300 feet a second with a, uh, a 357 Magnum uh, uh, Benjamin Bulldog air rifle. Uh, you'd be surprised how that comparison comes out. They're both very accurate, but there's times when one is better than the other. Thought I would share those with you. That's just some of the things coming in the future. Well, let's go downstairs and I'll tell you a little bit more about today's video. Well, like I say, we're gonna have some fun today, uh, but I wanted to bring you down here to this level which is a level below our shooting platform. And uh, I'll brief you on the first tool I have against constructive, destructive critters. Uh, and before I do that, Renee, if you'll show them where our third video in this series, there'll be three videos in this series. And the uh, third one is gonna be up in the attic of our home where critters also live and our fight with them in that location. Uh, each time I come down here and I look out there on the ice, I'm reminded of a friend of mine named Alan. He was a dentist and he went to Alaska. He was after maybe the biggest North American critter there is, and that was a polar bear. He paid uh, those Eskimos a lot of money. Uh, it was over $10,000 to a tribe and uh, they loaded up all the sleds and the dogs and barking and they, they actually made him clothes, uh, uh, fur clothes like this hat is, uh, in his size. He took measurements and sent them to him. And uh, he arrives and he said, okay, so uh, what are we gonna do first to track a polar bear? And they said, no, the polar bear is gonna track us. <laughs> and that's when he knew he had really got himself into a hunt because that's exactly what happens. You see, when all the grass is buried in snow and ice and you have freezing temperatures, there's no smell except animals. And they took those sleds and dogs out onto uh, the ice of uh, 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 Alaska and out there on one of the Great Lakes, they told him that the smell could be uh, smelled for 10, 15 miles away and the polar bears will be coming. So they went to bed, got in the tents. About two in the morning, they're awakened by the dogs barking. The dogs had been strategically put around the, uh, the, the tribe's uh, camp. And by the time he got the clothes on, got the gun out, three dogs had already been killed by the polar bears. And he, was t he, was t he shot the polar bear uh, who came across that ice for them. But the, the dogs held off that polar bear until he was ready. And they said, don't worry about the price of the dogs. It was in the price of this hunt. So I, I just will never forget it. Well, now let's find out what one of my tools are if a polar bear showed up here. 
see underneath our shooting stand, we have a two car garage down here. We don't call it that. Uh, the name is actually that sign you see there, uh, Russ's Toy Box. And what we have here are Dobermans to uh, take care of the uh, destructive critters that we have around here now. Mercy, I don't want you to show any mercy to them out there. Go out there and find a fox. Go on. Uh, let's see. Here's ghost, ghost. Go out there and find a coyote. Get him. Go get it. And uh, here's Angel. Angel, look for a wild boar. Okay, where's the fox and the coyote and the wild boar? <laughs> Next time. Again, welcome to our home. I'm not sure you're going to get to see a small piece of the video we just took outside because it had my wife, Dr. Paula, in it. <laughs> and uh, she was feeding the Doberman, so we kind of caught her by surprise. Um, if she's not in it, then you'll know she was, but asked to be taken out. Well, if you look at this table, you'll sure see a host of things that we're going to be educating you on today in, uh, and, and tomorrow we're going to be doing, in effect, three videos here all on trapping. Uh, as simple as just repelling something to poisoning it, to capturing it live, uh, to kind of push it out of the house a bit, uh, to actually trapping it and in a lethal trap. But today, and today only, uh, on this video, we're gonna be talking about uh, live trapping, uh, getting an animal and taking it down the road, if you will. I took some to the park in town, found out that was illegal, and ultimately ended up taking some raccoons and squirrels about five miles away. They say that's the, that's the, the, the line where you can get to make sure they don't come back. I think the first thing I should cover is this. Each state has its own rules and laws on uh, critters, destructive critters. Uh, you'll find those laws and rules in booklets. You'll also find them on the internet. But they're not the only rules you need to know about. There are federal laws, but they typically only focus on the animals that cross state lines, like trout and salmon and geese and ducks. And so often your state hunting license has to have a federal stamp stuck on those uh, so that you know those rules and laws and you're licensed to hunt those federal type animals. But we're not done there. You've also got to know about your local township or city and even the subdivision. They may have rules too. Uh, a lot of rules. Uh, I only know the Michigan rules. I'm at this moment only licensed to be in Michigan to trap and to hunt. But I can tell you that as a general statement, um, rules get lax if a critter is being destructive on your property. You uh, are supposed to have a license. You don't necessarily have to have one, let's say on a woodchuck uh, who's open all 12 months of the year. Uh, so find out your rules, make sure you've got them. Uh, before you get involved in anything that's on this table. When it comes to catching destructive critters alive, let me tell you that one of the things that's out there are wasp. Uh, my dad and I would get on a ladder. I was at the top of the ladder. He was holding the ladder. And we'd go out at night and here's this big wasp nest. I did this several times. And uh, they were asleep in that nest at night. We were careful not to shine a flashlight on them because that, that, that nest can let a light go all the way through it. I uh, got up with a black contractor's bag and put it around, then tied a knot. They still didn't know I was there. I then took a saw. And uh, I wish I'd had a power saw, but it, uh, I took a handsaw and I cut the limb on each side. Well, they were waking up then. 
I came down the ladder holding that contractor's bag with the nest inside, and man, they were poom, 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 hitting that uh, really, really strongly. I was just glad I wasn't in that bag. I would have been really, really torn up. And so we took that bag and went about five miles up the road and tossed it out, and they, I assume, uh, made another nest in another tree out there. I know in uh, this Detroit area, we had a man who was living alone. His wife had passed away, he was retired. And uh, his kids would visit and they would say, you know, there's a humming going on up there in that attic. And he said, I'll take care of it. One day he decided he would. He went up through the hole in the, the uh, uh, attic and he came across the paper reported a nest that was the size of a Volkswagen. Well, by the time he figured it out, and he's got a flashlight shining up at it, the wasp knew who he was. And down that ladder, he stumbled and fell, fell on the ground. They swarmed him. He ran outside and was out in the lawn uh, before he got help. Uh, he lived, but what a way to find out you've got destructive critters in your attic. Um, so, uh, you want to take care of them. Now, I've got my insurance policy. This is yard guard. You go up in an attic, it's kind of nice to spray up there and get the, that fog up there, uh, chasing a lot of stuff out um, before you're up in there. Uh, DEET. When you get any type of mosquito repellent and black flies if you're out fishing, uh, what you want is to make sure you know how much DEET. Now right there it says 55%. Uh, here in the States, you can only get DEET up to about 20, 25%. You go to Canada and you can get 80, 90%. But it's all about DEET. It's not killing the mosquitoes, it's keeping them away. You put it on yourself and it keeps them away. I talked a little bit a minute ago about the live traps and how they get in here the humming uh, traps. Uh, a lot of deer and rabbits, God bless deer and rabbits, but boy, they could sure make a mess of a garden and destroy it. So if you're really into gardening, you'll probably want some of this uh, rabbit and deer repellent right here. Um, let's talk about uh, cages. These are all what they call have a heart, live traps. Uh, have a heart, let this animal live, if you will. They got a real small one for chipmunks and squirrels, um, a little bigger one for rabbits <coughs> and, and big squirrels. This uh, larger cage here is for raccoons, fox. Then I got a cage back here for coyotes. Um, I cut up these paper plates in the shape of pie and I put the bait on them. In this example, I've got peanut butter, and if it were squirrels, I would sprinkle some bird seed on it. We're gonna get into the baits. It's very important about the baits. And when we get to the live, or rather the lethal traps uh, tomorrow, uh, you're going to, you're gonna find out that we not only need a bait, but we need a lure or attract it. So we've got two things going on those traps. But when we're talking about these live traps, we slide one in. Now you'll see there's a, a door at each end. So I slide in the bait at that end and I, uh, I lock it down. There's sections here where this can lock down and hold it shut. Because boy, a squirrel can really uh, get whopping around in there and one out or a raccoon or whatever you have. And I just use one end for the animal to enter. Now, unlike a, uh, well, it's like a mouse trap too. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is a live trap. And it's, you don't put the food on this disc in here. You might think you do, but you don't. What we need here is the weight of the animal on both feet standing on it to get the food that is beyond the, the plate. So once they get on this and they put their weight on it, they're trapped. 
And that's the way all these uh, live traps work. Uh, just remember, the bait, which I'll be sharing baits with you in a minute, has to be on the other side of the plate. The plate is not for baits, the plate is for their weight. Uh, you're gonna find out that you're gonna come and it's all been set, but the doggone animal's gone. Well, that's when a trail camera will come into play and you will uh, set that up and watch it. And you'll see just exactly how they got the food and got away and make you a much better trapper in the future. Uh, this isn't so much for live trapping. This is uh, for lethal trapping, but I'll show it to you now. Uh, this is a, a sound maker of a, a doe or a, a, a fawn. And then sometimes when we're hunting with a crossbow or air gun, we want to use the sound maker to, to bring them in. And that adds a new dimension to hunting uh, when you do that. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, that drill tomorrow and uh, some of these uh, lethal traps tomorrow as well. The next question is where do we put these traps, etc., etc. You know, if I came to you and I said, uh, by the way, uh, how do you, uh, where are we right now? You might say, well, the freeway's a mile that way and the boulevard's over this way and that big church is down the road here. Uh, and I say, okay, now get in the car, let me blindfold you and I'll take you on your path of uh, where, you, where you travel during the week. I'll take you out of the car, a couple hundred yards off of your path and have you lay on your stomach in somebody's backyard. And while you're laying there, just looking at grass, I'll say, where are we now? See, I, I, I really don't know where we are right now. Well, obviously the more higher you get up, if we had a ladder, if we got you on the roof, if we had a drone go up two, 300 uh, feet in the air, you'd say, okay, now I can tell you. And the point is we know where we are because of elevation. I remember in Wyoming, I was always on the mountaintops, but I kept an eye on where that ranch was uh, from that height so I would know how to get home. Uh, well, the same is true with animals. So how do animals handle that? Well, that's why you see so many tracks, like there's one in our backyard now, where they just travel uh, along the, a building or along a fence line or along running water. They follow those things because that's how they know how to get around. Uh, they don't have a GPS system, and yet they might cover a mile, but they cover it with these known paths, these known uh, symbols of uh, their travels. So we, we wanna make sure that we put this trap, whatever trap we're using, right on that trail. You say, right on it, how about on the side? No, you see, if, if we went down the road you might pass a McDonald's 50 times and never go in. But if I said, no, the McDonald's is in the center of the road and we got to get out and walk through the McDonald's, get it and, and continue our trip, then you might say, you know, while we're here, why don't we just go ahead and eat a McDonald's? That's the same with animals. So we put the, the trap right on their path. They can't ignore it. So uh, in real estate, they call it location, location, location. That's the most important thing. That's the way it is with these traps too, live or lethal. We've got to have them put in a good location. You have to think like uh, a wild animal and then you can start to, to do it. The second thing is once we have the trap in place, we want a good presentation. That's what a chef will say at a restaurant. He wants a platter with everything around it and some color and everything, and a nice presentation when it's put in front of you. Imagine a big turkey platter and a hot dog at one end, and that's it. Not a very good presentation. So we've got to do a good presentation. They don't call it that in trapping, they call it a set. Well, much like a, a theater set or, you know, uh, uh, the third play or whatever, uh, a nice uh, setup. Uh, is, is what they're referring to, a nice set. And when they find that set that's very appealing, they continue to use it. Um, and so uh, we wanna make sure that we have a good set. 
I'll be talking more about that one tomorrow in our third video on this series. We'll be actually talking about the seven biggest mistakes and one of them is you just don't spend enough time on that set. And uh, then we'll go up into the attic with an air gun and see what we can find and shoot up there. I hope you've had a good time. Uh, I hope you've learned something today. Um, remember that all of our videos <coughs> are meant to help you be more air gun sharp. Uh, be sure you give us a thumbs up if you thought the video was worth something. And uh, if you wanna make sure you catch the second, third videos coming, uh, then subscribe and you'll be the first on your block to know.